Welcome everyone. Today we're going to learn the consolidation financial statement. So we're going to look at one question and we're going to look at all the workings that is relevant to the consolidated financial statement. And we're going to explain in detail so that we understand the breakdown and the reason and how to adjust the consolidated financial statement. Now, this is a very much important for your uh, financial statement paper. And in the exam, definitely one question will be there. So you need to be very much careful to uh, remember all the workings because this question is mainly based on the workings. So if your workings is good, if you know how to adjust the figure, it will not take too much time to complete the financial statement. But if you find difficulty on the workings, then it might be a little bit complicated for you. So let's try to read the question very carefully. And I'll try to explain every single adjustment we require in order to complete our financial statement. So we we'll start with our uh, activity nine. And it's the Morse PLC. Now let's read the question first very carefully. MPLC accures 60% of the issued share capital and voting right of Lewis Limited on 1st January 2010 for 24,000. Now, few information we understand from the first line. The first one is 60% accurate. Now, for example, if any question they don't give you the 60 percent but if the question said mplc accurate for example 5000 share 5000 share of lewis limited so what we have to do we have to look at the lewis limited financial statement i will look at how much total share they have on the share capital and we have to see how much the parent company buying. For example, if the Lewis Limited have 10,000 total share capital, and if the Morse PLC buy 5,000, that means we can understand they buy 50%. It's a very important to understand the group structure because without that, we'll not be able to calculate the goodwill and the non-controlling interest. So first we need to identify the group structure. The next one we look at that is called the date of acquisition on 1st of January. This is another important date. Why it is important? Because we like to see the day we acquire or purchase this subsidiary from that day till year ending, for example, till December, January to December, how much profit do you make? That is called return earnings. And this return earnings will tell us, obviously, the performance of the company. Now, for example, if the return earnings is 100 pound that we make from Jan to December, and out of 100 pounds, 60% will be taken by M, that is most limited, and 40% will be taken by L, that is Lewis Limited. So you have to be very much careful with this calculation so that we understand at the date of acquisition and the post acquisition date, the difference between these two, because you have to find the profit we make during the year. The next point we have consideration. That is 240,000, we can see. Or just if you don't consider the three zero because we have three zero here, so you can say 24,000. Consideration represent how much we paid, how much we paid to buy this 60% share. How much we paid to buy this 60% share of the subsidiary. Now this information is clear for us. The next one is says at that date, at that date means on 1st of January. That means on the date of acquisition. 
at that date means at the date of acquisition on 1st of January, the day I purchased that subsidiary. Lewis Limited had a issue share capital of 10,000. So out of 10,000, we buy 60%, so we buy 6,000. And a share premium of 5,000. Remember that we buy the share capital and the voting right. Share capital is only 10,000 and voting rights only relevant to share capital. Remember that share premium, they, they don't have any voting right, even the preference share, they don't have any voting right. The people who own the ordinary share, only these people have the voting right. And to call someone subsidiary, we have to make sure we buy the voting right. That means we can exercise the power over that company. So if I don't have the voting right, even I own this company 60%, I will not be able to call that company subsidiary. I have to make sure I have the power on that, that company to control everything. And the controlling power comes from the voting right. So you need to be very much careful with that. In the exam, you really don't have to worry about that because they will make it very simple. And definitely they'll give you, you have a voting right or to exercise the power over that company. The next information we have here, written earnings of 11,263. Written earnings, 11,263. Now, this written earnings at the date of acquisition that means on 1st of January, so at acquisition date. Why it is important to remember that? Because the day I buy this company, that time they have a reserve of profit, 11,263. So I like to see during the year from January to December, how much profit we make. So for example, at the end of the year, if it is 12,000, that means the difference between 11,263 and 12,000, this is the profit we make during the year. So that's why it is important to remember written earnings at the date of acquisition and the post acquisition. Extract of the financial statement of financial position for the two companies at 31st December 2010 are shown below. So looking at the financial statement for this two company, let's quickly have a look. And after that, we'll look at some adjustment. Then we'll start our portion. So if we look at the financial statement for this two company, so we can see here, we have asset and the liability and the asset and liability has to be equal. So for both company total asset has to be equal to total equity and liability. Total asset has to be total equity and liability for both company. Start with the property plan equipment. So when you prepare the consolidated financial statement, remember both company will be added together. So on the consolidation, we have to add it both to find it out how much is the total plus plus if there are any fair value adjustment. So on the additional information, if the question said there is adjustment for the fair value, we have to add here. For example, if there is a value increase of the asset, the question tell us you have to add it that because we always have to consider the fair value for the consolidated financial statement. The next one we have investment. This is the money we invested to buy the subsidiary. So this one only relevant to the parent because parent company, most limited invested this money to buy 60% of the subsidiary that is Lewis Limited. So this one will not be in our financial statement because this is only the investment for most PLC. Inventory, again, we have to add it, these two together to find how much is the total value of the inventory. And one thing we have to remember, if there is any, if there is any provision for unrealized profit, 
PUP, provision for unrealized profit, we have to take away. So make sure you have to less. What is provision for unrealized profit? When parent sold something to the subsidiary or subsidiary sold something to the parent, and if they make any profit, and if this profit is still on the inventory. So if a parent sold something to subsidiary and the subsidiary sold something to the parent, and if the profit is still inside on the warehouse or on the stock, this profit has to be eliminated because we cannot have a profit between each other. So it is called intercompany profit. We have to eliminate the intercompany profit. So from the question, we have to look. And if we see, is there any profit is still we have left on the stock or on the, on the inventories, we have to find it out how much it is and we have to minus it from the inventory. The next one, we have a trade receivables. Again, we have to look at this too, we have to add it. Here, we have to be careful one thing, that is if the company have any intercompany transaction, intercompany transaction, intercompany transaction, what is intercompany transaction? Intercompany transaction is when the parents need to give some money to the subsidiary and the subsidiary need to give some money to the parent. Now, when this company together is a no point to paying to each other. For that reason, from the total receivables, I'll minus the money due to subsidiary and from the payables, I have to also minus the money due from the parent. So ultimately the main point here is the parent don't have to pay to subsidiary and the subsidiary don't have to pay to the parent. So it will just offset to each other because both they are now become one group of company and they really don't have to pay each other again. So they don't have to pay each other anymore. For that reason, both trade receivables and the trade people will be reduced. Normally the trade receivables is a debit. We need to make it credit, so it will go down. Normally the trade payable is a credit. We need to make it debit, so it will be go down. And then we have a cash and cash equivalent. We need to add it this too. And have to find how much is the consolidated. The next section we have equity and liability. Equity and liability is quite simple. Here we only take the parent. Remember that only the parent will not consider the subsidiary share capital, share premium, or the written earnings. We will only consider, will only consider for the parent. So here I'll take 45,000 share capital that belongs to parent then 13,000 share premium that belongs to parent. And the written earnings, obviously we need to do the workings to see what is the adjustment. Because written earnings will have the parent written earnings. So how much is the parent? 33,416. Plus we have to add the money I gained during this period. So the time I buy this one, subsidiary from that time, how much I make. So if you remember at the beginning of the question, we have the written earnings at the date of acquisition. So on that day, how much was that written earnings and how much we have at the year end, we find the difference. On, on that difference, we'll have 60% of our right. So this will be added. So 60% from subsidiary. And also we need to look at, is there anything we have to take away? What is we have to take away? For example, the PUP, provision for unrealized profit, that we said it has to be minus from the inventories, also from the written earnings. And also if there is an impairment, impairment of goodwill. So if there is a reduction of the value of the goodwill, that will also reduce our written earnings. So we need to do workings in a separate page to do the calculation and we have to record this one on the financial statement. 
but for the share capital and premium we record only for the parent, not for the subsidiary. You have to remember that. Then the next one here on the equity and the liability section, one more new section will be added here. We called it NCI. That is non-controlling interest. NCI, non-controlling interest. Non-controlling interest represent the 40% right of the subsidiary. So how much the value of the NCI or non-controlling that belongs to subsidiary will come here. So you have to show the controlling value. So how much I'm controlling, how much is the value for that? And the non-controlling, how much I don't control. So both we have to show our equity and liability section. And this will come under the equity, remember that, and that gave us total equity. So this is a little bit um, working, so you need to do as well for that. So we need to see how much it is. And uh, of course, like uh, I will show you how to do all these workings. The next one, we have the long-term loan. So here I just need to add this to 25 plus eight, and that will be our consolidated financial statement. And then we have a, a trade and other payable. We need to add it this to. At the same time, we have to minus if an intercompany, the way I said before, for the trade receivables. So less intercompany transaction. Then the tax liability, just added this to 5763 plus 174. <clears throat> and that will give us our total tax liability, 59 whatever it is, so we have to carry on that. And after that, finally, our total equity and the liability has to be equal. So this is the little um, explanation of every single item. You're not going to see anything new on the exam. If you understand every single entity from here, you'll be absolutely fine on the exam. All right, well, let's move on to our Next information, further information. So let's have a look. What is the further information we have? On the further information section, we have first information A says at 1st January 2010, the fair value of the non current assets of Lewis Limited was 2,500. We are not considering the three zero because we have three zero in the top, so we just can't ignore it. So 2,500 was the fair value adjustment more than the carrying amount. So the asset we have, the value of the asset is 2,500 more than what, what value we have currently on the financial statement. And that means this 2,500 will be added with our non-current asset that we have discussed before. So this has to be added with our non-current asset. So property, plant, and equipment. So 2,500 will be plus there. Plus 2,500 on our equity uh, property, plant, and equipment. All right, the next thing we have, uh, they ask to ignore the depreciation, so you don't have to worry about the depreciation. If there's a depreciation, you can minus the depreciation. The next one we have here, number B, is uh, included in most PLC trade and other receivables is 13,000 or from Lewis Limited. Included in a Lewis Limited trade and other payable 13,000 due to most PLC. So what we understand, 13,000 from Lewis Limited and 30,000 due to Morse PLC. So it is of course like intercompany transaction. So the Lewis Limited expecting 13,000 from Morse PLC, that's why it is a receivables. And on the Morse Limited payable, 13,000 included because they have to give 13,000 to Lewis Limited, it's a liability. So asset for Lewis Limited and the liability for Morse PLC. So this is intercompany transaction. All you have to do, you have to 
minus 13,000 from the trade receivables and minus 13,000 from the trade payable, that's it. Because they will not pay to each other anymore. So it has to be offset by doing the reversal journal. So we'll make trade receivables credit and trade payable debit. The next one we have here, number C, it said during the year, Morse PLC sold some inventory to Lewis Limited for 50,000. So Morse Limited sold to Lewis Limited. So parent selling to subsidiary. This good cost is 30,000. So that means if I sold it for 50 and the cost was 30, that means I make a profit of 20,000. The profit is 20,000. The next question is, is there any still left on the inventory? If nothing is left, I have no problem. But if something is left, we have to find it out. The provision for unrealized profit for that. So you can see here, the question said a quarter of the a quarter of these goods is still remaining in the inventory. That's the problem. So we need to find it out how much it is. So a quarter means one fourth. So you have to divide by four times by one. And that will give us 5,000. So 5,000 is the PUP, provision for unrealized profit. Now, what we need to do for that, we have to minus it from RE, return earnings, less from there, RE from parent. Remember that this one has to be careful. You minus the profit who sell the inventory. So if the subsidiary sell to parent, you have to minus it from the subsidiary return earnings. If the parent sold to subsidiary, then you have to minus it from the parent return earnings. So here, parent is selling to the subsidiary. For that reason, we have to minus it from the parent return earnings. And also this one have to be minus from the inventories. From the inventories, we have to minus this 5,000 as well, less. So 5,000 will minus from RE, from parent. 5,000 is minus from the inventories. The next one, it says the director of Morse PLC have concluded that the goodwill has been impaired by 674. So impairment of the goodwill, so you have to minus it. Impairment of the goodwill, we have to minus it, the goodwill from our uh, written earnings. So this will have a minus from written earnings. So RE will be less by 674. Need to be very careful. If it is environment of the goodwill, RE will be less. Also the goodwill, 674 will be less. So from the goodwill will minus 674 because the value of the goodwill is reduced or impaired. And also it will reduce our profit. So it will have a two impact. The last one we have, Morse PLC has decided that non-controlling interest will be value at its proportionate share of the net asset. So you have to value the NCI, non-controlling interest with the value of net share, uh, proportionate share of the net asset. That is 40% share belongs to NCI because 40% owned by the non-controlling or the subsidiary. So this is a story of our adjustment. And now we can complete the question because now we have all of this. Now, there are a few workings that we have to do before we start the question. And if we are happy with the workings, that means we'll be able to do this question very easily. So let's start with our workings. The first workings we'll do that is for goodwill. Workings number one is for the goodwill. Here, I have to know how much was the asset of net asset of the subsidiary. So net asset of sub net asset of subsidiary at both debt. 
at the date of acquisition and at the date of post acquisition. So I'll say at acquisition date, SAQ acquisition date and post acquisition date. Post acquisition date means a year ended date. So at the date of acquisition, when you buy this subsidiary and after one year, that is post acquisition date. So let's start with our subsidiary net asset. So net asset means total asset minus total liabilities. So we can look at start with our share capital. So share capital, 10,000. Share premium, 5,000. Then written earnings, so remember that at the written earnings, we have two written earnings, one at the date of acquisition, one at the date of post acquisition. So this one we have on the financial statement as the year end. This is post acquisition. So that is 17,763. And this share capital have no chance. It was 10,000 at the beginning, the question said. <clears throat> and also share premium also was beginning 5,000, now 5,000. So they did not issue any new share capital or any new share premium. If on the acquisition date is different and the post acquisition is different, so you have to make sure you look at the question very carefully. But here on the acquisition date, they said it was uh, 10 and five. And also like on the financial statement that is year end debt, 31st of December, still it is 10 and five. If you look at the question at the beginning is 10 share capital, five share premium and written earnings 11,263. So it's a written earnings at acquisition date, it was 11,263. That's it. Now we will be able to look at our next thing. The next thing we had here, if you remember the fair value adjustment, they said uh, 2,500 need to be increased, the non current asset. This will have impact on our net asset as well for the financial statement. So it said the fair value of the non, non current asset of Lewis Limited. Lewis is our subsidiary. So if the fair value increase, the net asset will be also increased. So right here, fair value adjustment. And you write 2,500 and 2,500. And that's it. More or less, we find our net asset for the subsidiary. We'll add this two together. So if we added all of this, we have a total 28,763. And if we added this one, that will give us 35,263. Now we know from the day we buy this one, we buy 60% on the date of acquisition. So we said we buy 60% of the total net asset. So the net asset subsidiary have, I own 60%. So if I own the 60%, the value of the 60% of the net asset is 17,257.8. So 60% I own. And the next question is how much you paid for the 60%. So if you look at the consideration that we discussed before as well. So the consideration of the 60%, we paid 24,000 pound for that. So the value of the net asset of 60% is 17,257, but actually the consideration, consideration, or we paid actually 24,000. That means we paid more than the net asset. It will be always happen. We will be always paid more. And for that reason, the difference will come as a goodwill. So the value was uh, 17,000, but we actually paid 24,000. So the difference will create, we called it goodwill. 
So six, seven, four, two. Can make it sound it to 6,742 pound. And that's our goodwill. Because we paid extra. So the value of the 60% of the total net asset was 17,257. But we paid 24. Why we paid extra? Because of the goodwill. How much? 6,742. And finally, one more information we have on the question and that is the goodwill is impaired. Goodwill is impaired by 674. So we need to reduce this one, impairment. So less impairment. Less impairment. And that is 674. If you minus that, so our net goodwill value is six zero six eight. Goodwill. This one we need it because obviously we have to show the goodwill value in the financial statement. The next one we need to look at the NCI percentage, non-controlling interest. So very simple. If sixty percent I own then 40% owned by the NCI. So just you need to calculate how much is the 40% of the post acquisition. And that will give us 14,105. 14,105 and that's my NCI. Message, this is our first workings. There's the main workings and the big workings. So if you understand that, it will be absolutely fine. Some uh, books or some uh, method uh, can show you a different way of calculation, but it's up to you how you understand. There is nothing wrong with that if you do the workings different way, uh, but uh, it depends up to you how you understand it uh, more clearly. And this makes sense. So the way you understand, you can follow that way. The next one we have the adjustment. This is for intercompany. So we said 13,000. Number two, 13,000 have to be minus from both, 13,000, 13,000. So it's still working as number two. We have to make a trade payable for more PLC. We'll make it debit because we're not going to pay this liability, 13,000. Normally trade payable is a credit, we're making a debit because we're not gonna pay and trade receivables on the Lewis PLC account or Lewis limited account. We'll make it credit because we're not going to pay, not going to pay that to the MPLC, 13,000. It's quite simple. The next one we have workings for the, workings three, that's for the inventory. So the inventory we have here, first I need to look at how much is the inventory we have on the cushion. So inventory. So we have this plus this, 18,283 plus 14,684. So that will give us 32,967. And you have to minus the POP, less unrealized profit. And that is 5,000 because we have showed this one, 20,000 was the profit. And one fourth is still on the inventory. So 5,000 have to be taken away from the inventories and from the return on its both. So our inventories values will be 27,967. 27,967. All right, this is our workings number three. And we have one more workings, that's it. That is called return earnings. So let's do the return earnings. Written earnings. So written earnings, as you said, you follow the parent only. So it said parent re 
how much was the plan return earnings? So we said it was 33,416. 33,416. This is the plan return earnings. Then you have to find it out how much is our profit from the subsidiary. Now, if you remember, when you buy, the return earnings for the subsidiary was 11,263. And at the end of the year, we have 17,763. So we make some profit during the period. So we need to see how much it is. So 17,763 minus 11,263. And the difference we have, we have 60% right on that profit because I have accrued 60% of the subsidiary. So the profit I make from the day I buy the subsidiary and uh, for one year, whatever profit we make together, I have a 60% right on that profit. And that will give me 3,300. 3,300. And finally, have some good old impairment. It will be minus from there. Impairment, impairment, that is 674. We have to take away. Also, we have some POP, provision for unrealized profit. We can minus it from here, actually, because um, it will be minus from the parent. But if you could do it from here, it's not a problem because it's just working. But you need to understand there's 5,000, that provision for unrealized profit has to be minus from the parent return earnings only. All right, so if we make the workings now, the return earnings will be 31,642. That's our return earnings. So I've done all the workings now. Now I'll be able to complete the question very quickly. So let's have a look. Let's start with our non-kind asset. So the non-kind asset, first we start with the goodwill. Then we have a property plan equipment. So property plan equipment, you have to add this to plus the 2,500 for our fair value adjustment. So let's do that. So I said, first start with the goodwill. Goodwill and the goodwill workings we have. The goodwill we have here 6068. 6068. That's the first workings. Then we have uh, PPE. We said we have to add it this to parent and subsidiary. That is 63,781 plus 27,184, plus the fair value adjustment, 2,500. That's it. And that will give us 93,465. And if you added this to, that will give us total 99,533. So our non-current asset is done. Then we move to the current asset. The current asset, we have inventories. Inventories, we have to add both parent and subsidiary. So we have from the parent, 18,283. 18,283. Plus we have a subsidiary. 14,684. And you have to make sure we minus our POP. That is 5,000. We already done the workings here. You can see 227,967. 27,967 will be the inventory. Then we have a trade receivables, trade receivables. So you have 29,000 parent, 400 and 
74 is parent plus 14,000. Zero to three minus 13,000 is the intercompany transaction that we show 13,000 will not pay, will make that trade receivables credit 13,000. So that will give us total 30,497. Then we have a cash and cash equivalent. So cash. We have two eight seventy two for the parent. For the subsidiary, we have eighty eight. That will give us twenty nine six zero. Then we have total equity and the liability. Here we only look for the parent, remember that. So share capital, 45,000. Only parent, share premium, only parent, 13,000. Then written earnings, the workings we have done, 31,642, 31. 1,642, and then CI. NCI, that workings you have done here, 14,105, 14,105. And total equity will be 103,747. And if we added the asset, my total asset, so this is the current asset, total current asset will be 61,424. If I added this to non-current and current, my total asset will be 160,957. <laughs> So the next session, we have a non-current liability. The question said we have a bank loan, so long-term loan, loan. The parent have 25,000 and the subsidiary have 8,000. That will give us 33,000. And current liability, we have a trade payable. Parent have 16,000. 231, subsidiary have 15,000, 042, and 13,000 you have to minus as intercompany transaction. That is show payable account has to be debit. And it will be 18,273. Then you have a tax liability. So we have a parent, 5763 plus 174 for the subsidiary, 5937. And that will give us the total liability. That is 24. So we have here 5937 and 18. So that will give us 24,210. So we have now current and non current and equity. So if I added the total liability, current plus non current, so current plus non current, 33 plus 24, that gives me 57,000. 10. If I added this one with the equity as well, that will give me total equity and liability. And that will be 160,957. That is exactly will match with our total asset. And that's how we can complete our consolidated traded financial statement. Remember that this consolidation uh, obviously like will be a little bit tricky and will be definitely in the exam. 
either the financial statement or the profit and loss account. So in this section, we have learned our financial statement position, and maybe later on, we'll be make another session for the profit and loss account. Hopefully if you practice all the workings and if you understand all this additional information, you will be absolutely fine for this exam. Uh, but as I said, you need a practice and it's not difficult, but could be tricky. Only the way you can do better to understand the whole picture, try to understand every single reason why you add, why you're taking away, and try to understand the story behind the calculation. Do not just memorize because otherwise you'll forget. Try to understand every single adjustment, why you're doing it and what's the reason behind. Try to practice the workings so many times on the paper and try to make a note for that. And that's how you can make yourself more ready in the exam. Remember that in the final exam, you're not gonna see more than this. So this is the maximum workings you can expect in the exam. So really don't have to worry too much. If you are happy with that, you will be absolutely fine. So hopefully uh, you will understand what I explained. If you have more questions, feel free to email me. And hopefully in the next section, we're going to look at the profit and loss account. Thank you very much everyone for watching.